today I am going to read the story Moonshot. It's called Moonshot, The Flight of Apollo 11, and it's written by Brian Floca. So this book is different than the books that we normally read because it's actually a true story. So Brian Floca didn't think up this story in his head. He took what happened in real life and he put it into his own words. And he had to do some research in order to find out all the facts. So Brian wrote the words, but he didn't make up the story. This is a true story. <clears throat> Moonshot, The Flight of Apollo 11. High above, there is the moon, cold and quiet, no air, no life, but glowing in the sky. <clears throat> Here below, there are three men who close themselves in special clothes, who click, lock hands in heavy gloves, who click, lock heads in large round helmets. It is summer here in Florida, hot and near the sea. But now these men are dressed for colder, stranger places. They walk with stiff and awkward steps in suits not made for earth. They have studied and practiced and trained and said goodbye to family and friends. If all goes well, they will be gone for one week, gone where no one has been. <clears throat> Their two small spaceships are Columbia and Eagle. They sit atop the rocket that will raise them into space. A monster of a machine. It stands 30 stories. It weighs 6 million pounds. A tower full of fuel and fire and valves and pipes and engines. Too big to believe, but built to fly the mighty, massive Saturn V. The astronauts squeeze into Columbia's sideways seats, lying on their backs, facing toward the sky. Neil Armstrong on the left, Michael Collins on the right, Buzz Aldrin in the middle. Click, and they fasten straps. Click, and the hatch is sealed. There they wait while the Saturn hums beneath them. So they're getting ready to lift off. That is a very big rocket ship. <clears throat> Near the rocket in launch control and far away in Houston in mission control, there are numbers, screens, and charts, ways of watching and checking every piece of the rocket and ships, the fuel, the valves, the pipes, the engines, the beats of the astronauts' hearts. As the countdown closes, each man watching is asked the question, go, no go? And each man watching answers back, go. 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 Apollo 11 is go for launch. So they're all ready to go. Ten, nine, eight, seven. Ignition sequence started. Flames push hard against the pad. Every second pushing harder. But still, the rocket does not rise. Mighty arms hold it steady. Hold it till the countdown's finished. Three, two, one, zero. Lift off. The rocket is released. It rises foot by foot. It rises pound by pound. It climbs the summer sky. It rides a flapping, cracking flame and shakes the air and shakes the earth. It makes a mighty roar. Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin ride the fire and thunder, pressed deep in their seats, their bodies as heavy as clay. The rocket below them sheds parts as it soars. 
bolts explode, engines ignite, first stage, second stage, escape tower, gone. The rocket flies lighter, the rocket flies faster, in 12 minutes time it's 100 miles high. Then after an orbit around the earth to talk with mission control to check the course, to check the rocket and ships, the rocket's last stage fires again, pushing the astronauts on. And when the Earth has rolled beneath and rolled behind and let the astronauts go, the Saturn's last stage opens wide and releases Columbia, which was the rocket's tip. And also Eagle, hidden until now, a stranger ship, more bug than bird. A black and gold and folded spider. Michael Collins, Columbia's pilot, turns her back around. So they're in here that they need to get this part out of this container. <clears throat> and locks Columbia to Eagle. Then Armstrong, Collins, Aldrin leave the last of the Saturn and travel on in their two small ships, joined together, flown as one. They go rushing into darkness, flying toward the moon, cold and quiet, no air, no life but glowing in the sky. So this is all that is left. All the other parts of the rocket ship are just floating somewhere in space. And there's the moon. On board Columbia and Eagle, Armstrong, Collins, Aldrin, unclick, gloves, unclick, helmets unclick the straps that hold them down and float inside their small ships, their home for a week. Here, there is no up or down. An astronaut can spin in air and turn a floor into a wall or a ceiling to a floor. Here, on these sometimes ceilings, walls, and floors, everywhere, there are straps and screens and gauges, buttons, handles, hoses, and switches, switches, switches. There are food and clothes packed into corners. There are flight plans, flashlights, pens, and cameras. And they float, too. That's why there's Velcro everywhere for holding things so they stay put. So everything floats around in space. It doesn't just stay sitting where it belongs, even people. Here, when everything floats, it takes some skill to eat a meal. That ham salad sandwich? Watch the crumbs. Soup? It comes in a bag. Dry as dust. Fix the bag to the water gun. Fill it. Mix it. Stir it up. Cream of chicken? Not too bad. Better than the peanut cubes. Here, where everything floats, it takes some skill to go to sleep. There are no beds or pillows. No night or day. There is always, though, the hum of circuits, the whoo of machines, the thought of where you are, and the thought of where you're going. Oh, and one more thing. Here, where everything floats, and I mean everything, it takes some skill to use the toilet. It takes pipes and hoses and bags, and there's no fresh air outside the window. After a week, this small home will not smell so good. This is not why anyone wants to become an astronaut. But still ahead, there is the moon, cold and quiet. No air, no life, but glowing in the sky. Glowing and growing, it takes them in, it pulls them close. Is the moon growing? Or are they just getting closer? At the moon, Colin stays in Columbia, high above, a single circling soul. Armstrong and Aldrin leave in Eagle, and it takes it lower and lower. They have just enough time and just enough fuel. They have a plan and a place to land, a chosen safe site among the craters. So he keeps flying because he's going to pick them up and then the other two are in here and they're going to be the ones to land on the moon. <clears throat> 
Now friends and strangers in the distance down below stay up late, get up early, and stop as one to watch and wait. There are only maps and models to see. There is no camera that can show the landing far away. <clears throat> but what strange sounds there are to hear. Whistles, beeps, and static, strange new words, and quick clipped news of altitudes and speeds leaping across the dark between mission control and the men who are taking the eagle to land on the moon who are going where no one has been. <clears throat> On board Eagle, Aldrin calls out information while Armstrong steers the ship. They fly low and lower, looking, looking for their landing site. But now Eagle, they see, has flown too far. They are miles from where they mean to be. And below their small and spindly ship, they see no level place. Only broken stone and rock, only shadows and deep craters on the great and growing moon. Far from home and far from help, still steady, steady, the astronauts fly, till time and fuel are running out. So they don't have a lot of gas left, but they need to land on a flat place. Then there, clean and flat, not too far, 60 seconds left. Armstrong fires the rockets. Eagle slows and lower goes until a spray of dust, a bloom of moon, flowers up around her. Slow and slower, low and lower, low and lower, landing. And far away, where friends and strangers lean to listen, there comes a distant voice. Armstrong, calling from the moon, calm as a man who just parked a car. Houston? He says, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. Armstrong is calm, but on Earth they cheer. Then Armstrong and Aldrin climb down from the Eagle in heavy gloves and large round helmets in suits not made for Earth. In suits made for the moon, here below, all around them, cold and quiet, no air, but life. There is life on this strange and silent, magnificent moon, our two astronauts. Armstrong and Aldrin walk its rough, wide places. They stop, they hop, as light as boys, they lope, they leap. In the dust and stone beneath their feet, no seed has ever grown, no root has ever reached. Still, secrets wait there, the story of the moon. Where did it come from? How old is it? What is it made of? Not green sheaves. And up above the ash gray plains, the sky is pitch black and empty, and all the stars stay hidden. That is how bright the moon is when you are standing on its face. But in that blank and starless sky, high above, there is the earth. Rushing oceans, racing clouds, swaying fields and forests, family, friends, and strangers, everyone you've ever known, everyone you might, the good and lonely earth glowing in the sky. So we started out looking at the moon, but now our astronauts are on the moon and they can see home. This is where we live. <clears throat> when their work is done, Armstrong, Collins, Aldrin fly back together from the moon, which rolls beneath, which rolls behind, letting them loose, letting them go. They fly back together through the dark with pictures, stones, and stories, with secrets of the sky, with a view of home from far away. Back to family, back to friends, to warmth, to light, to trees, and blue water. Back from the moon, they land with a splash. So when they land, they actually land in the ocean, and then they have people help them get out of their little capsule. To warmth, to light, to home at last. Now we can see the moon again. They've been there. How cool. The end. So these are the three real people who went to the moon on the flight of Apollo 11 that we just read about. 
thanks for letting me tell you the story about Apollo 11.